Now, let's switch gears to stimulants, kind of the complete opposite in terms of the spectrum of psychoactive drugs. Stimulants are drugs that excite neural activity. So they speed up bodily functions and they stimulate your central nervous system. So caffeine, nicotine, cocaine, ecstasy, amphetamines, and methamphetamines. Uh, methamphetamine you're familiar with is crystal meth. Amphetamines typically used to be prescribed as diet pills before they started to recognize just how addictive they can become and how damaging they could be to you physically. Uh, so we'll go into each of these a little bit more in detail right now. Caffeine and nicotine work by increasing your heart and breathing rates. And they can also affect other autonomic functions. And what they do is they attempt to wake you up. So oftentimes those who are addicted to cigarettes, what they will do is when they start to feel kind of tired, they will go out and they will smoke to get that nicotine fix to kind of wake them up. Okay, I've discussed with you many times, and you've seen me drink my cups of coffee during the day. Uh, I very much feel that need to have that caffeine to kind of wake me up and uh, to get me alert. And you guys have seen me get the coffee shakes. Um, I still kind of have them a little bit right now because I had to have my afternoon Dr. Pepper. And uh, so that's very much because my you know, autonomic nervous system and my, my nervous system in general has been speeding up. And so that's what leads to uh, the caffeine, the coffee shakes. Caffeine can be found in a wide variety of different kinds of products. It's in teas, sodas, uh, chocolate. Many people don't necessarily think of it in that. Most of you guys are familiar with energy drinks where it combines caffeine and other uh, supposed energy-inducing uh, chemicals uh, like guarana and things like that. Um, most people use caffeine in some form every day, myself included. And it is considered to be the most widely used psychoactive drug, whether it be legal or illegal, okay? It increases your attentiveness and improves your mood. So it, it you know, basically goes about mimicking something called adenosine. It's another neurotransmitter that you need to familiarize yourself with. And it just makes you feel like you've got more energy and so your mood as such will kind of improve as a result of that. The issue with caffeine is, and this is not something that people are terribly well aware of, it's physically addictive. I notice a significant difference in my behavior in the summers when I'm not needing nearly as much caffeine to kind of get me through the day um, than when I'm drinking it pretty consistently during the school year. It can uh, last anywhere from a few days up to a week. You can get headaches because you're, experience, you're not getting that caffeine into your system. You can be very irritable and moody, uh, have difficulty in terms of being awake in general. They kind of refer to it as a rebound issue, that you are very, very, very tired because you're not getting that. Your body needs that caffeine to, to feel alert and awake, um, especially if you are a regular coffee, tea, or soda drinker like myself. Now, here's the thing, at high doses, uh, caffeine can have a, a very, very averse effect if you have too much of it. It can basically make you feel like uh, your heart is going to pop out of your chest. They call it the coffee nerves. Increased levels of anxiety, restlessness, you cannot sit still. Um, you can experience insomnia in some levels if you have too much of it. Um, I, I will give you a um, uh, learn from me kind of example here. I, in college, was attempting to pull an all-nighter, which I would never recommend that you guys do. It is not beneficial, and it does not help you to prepare for that test. I've told you multiple times, cramming does not benefit. I say this because I have learned the hard way. I was staying up one night to try to pull an all-nighter for this exam that I was really, really, really worried about. And so I took an over-the-counter caffeine pill because at that point I did not like drinking coffee. I thought coffee tasted gross. But I knew I needed something that would help me stay awake. So I took an over-the-counter caffeine pill and that was a huge mistake. I honestly felt like I was having a heart attack when I uh, was experiencing that. It gave me a horrible headache. It dehydrated me um, exponentially and so I just felt terrible. Uh, and I just, I could not stop shaking. I felt very anxious. I couldn't sit still. And it in no way, shape, or form helped me to prep for that test. 
it, it was not a good situation by any sense of the term. So it is very important that you watch the amount of caffeine that you ingest in a day. A lot of kids are becoming more and more used to drinking monsters and they actually just recently came out uh, just back in September and October with research that was done that shows horrible, horrible effects on a growing teenager and ingesting monster because it combines caffeine and other chemicals to, to wake you up. So um, some food for thought in terms of this legal uh, psychoactive drug. Now, how much caffeine is an acceptable amount? They have done research on this, and you can see this table. These are common sources of caffeine and the amount of range in milligrams that they have within them. They consider it to be okay and acceptable if you have 250 milligrams of caffeine in any given day. Problem is, is that many of us now are starting to attempt to have like these, um, uh, like hardcore levels of caffeine in coffee and things like that. They're starting to be advertised as having, you know, large amounts of caffeine that will keep you awake for a while. And uh, so it might be a good idea for you to just take a look at these. A lot of kids don't necessarily think about the fact that you can uh, get it from over-the-counter analgesics. Uh, anison, you can use it for, um, it's also present, caffeine is in... Um, taking Excedrin migraine medicine. So it's very important that you keep in mind that caffeine sources are very much out there even if you aren't aware that they are there. Amphetamines fall within the stimulant category as well. Um, many of you might have heard of them as speed or uppers. Uh, Jessie Spano from Saved by the Bell very famously had an episode dedicated to her and her addiction to speed. Um, speed pills to help her stay away because she was trying to study. Amphetamines suppress your appetite as do methamphetamines. Uh, so people that end up addicted to amphetamines and methamphetamines, uh, you can notice a very drastic weight loss with them. And interestingly enough, amphetamines were once prescribed as diet pills. Judy Garland, I alluded to her earlier, she was uh, made famous as being Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, very famous uh, movie actor during her time period of the 40s and 50s. She became addicted to amphetamines and struggled mightily for the rest of her life with addressing that addiction uh, because when she was at the ripe old age of 16, the production company that she was attached to contractually, um, MGM, said she needed to maintain her figure uh, while she was an actress and so they prescribed her amphetamines. It, they're no longer prescribed now uh, because their effects happen so quickly. I mean, you can just become very, very easily addicted and you need more and more of the drug um, to, to maintain the same level of effect. So the tolerance increases pretty rapidly. They can increase your concentration and reduce your fatigue, which is why people, um, you know, back at the point in time when they were prescribed, you know, liked them so much. Uh, the problem is they can also increase your anxiety and your irritability levels as well. Methamphetamines, you are most familiar with them nowadays as crystal meth. Uh, it is cooked. Oftentimes it gives off a really, really, really pungent, noticeable odor. And so that's why most of the time methamphetamine is produced out in the boonies, like out in rural areas. Because if you are cooking it and you have a neighbor that lives pretty close to you, it is really, really difficult for that smell to not be noticeable, and so people get busted much more easily. Um, cops get called because of the strange smell, so they will cook it in rural areas where you don't have neighbors that are so close to you, or they will do it in mobile meth labs, so they'll cook it in their trunk, because if you're constantly moving, then the smell can't um, be stagnant, so to speak. People can become very easily addicted to it. You basically will experience withdrawal symptoms of fatigue, just very, very tired. Um, it can deplete your brain of necessary neurotransmitters, and so you can fall into just you know a, a significant crash in terms of depression. It will bump up your appetite after you've gone, you start to go through withdrawal of it, um, just because it was suppressing your appetite while you were on the drug. It can be smoked or injected. Um, but it is highly, highly addictive. You can see uh, there is a very famous website out there called The Faces of Meth. I will show you some pictures from it when we are in class together. But you can see this is addiction after only a few months. Noticeable difference in this woman. 
very gaunt. Uh, her skin is yellow. She looks very jaundiced. Um, she has lost a lot of weight. And the other thing to keep in mind is that it's very easy to determine someone who is on methamphetamines and is addicted to them because they develop sores on their skin. And much of that is because they have documented that those that take meth crystal meth, um, feel as if that there is something crawling under their skin, so they will literally scratch at it until they tear away their skin and it scabs over. Over time, what happens is it lowers dopamine levels, and so it leaves you with permanent depressed functioning. So your brain chemistry is not the same after repeated amounts of methamphetamine use.